This is Getting to Know Your Bible, a program dedicated to the proclaiming of the good news of Jesus Christ. Here's Billy Lambert. There's one little word in the English language. Should it be eliminated, most of us couldn't even carry on a conversation, especially children. And that little word is the word why. I don't know about your children or your grandchildren, but both grandchildren and children of mine really work that word over. I remember one time my son was taking my grandson and his nephew on a five-hour trip with him, and he almost drove my son to distraction by asking him, why? 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 Well, we want to think about that today. Why me, Lord? Why me? We're talking about human suffering, a world of suffering. And many people want to know, why did it happen? Stay tuned as we discuss that today. Now today on Getting to Know Your Bible, we offer a free Bible correspondence course that you might know more about the course and how to receive it. We want to pause for just a moment. To help you in your study of the Bible, we want to send you this Bible correspondence course. This course is non-denominational. It's based on the Bible. It's conducted by mail, and it's free. To receive this course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible, P.O. Box 314, Somerdale, Alabama, 36580. Or call toll-free 1-877-711-5214. There's a passage I want to read to introduce our thoughts today, and it is found in the book of Judges, chapter 6, verse 13. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all of this befallen us? Now, there's a second passage I'd like to read, and it's found in Job, the third chapter, and verse 11. Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? Both of those passages are asking the question, why? Why? There isn't anything wrong with asking that question. Jesus asked it. While Jesus was on the cross, if you will recall, among the seven sayings of Jesus from the cross was this, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's not wrong to ask why. And I rather suspect that some of you right now have certain questions that you want answers to, and you're asking yourself, why? Why? So I think sometimes in trying to answer that question, we get some rather, I would just have to say, inadequate explanations. Rather inadequate explanations. Before we try to give you some idea about these explanations, let's think about what kind of problems that we encounter in life. And I've often thought in reading from Matthew, the 14th chapter, that they are illustrated in that chapter the three kinds of problems that we encounter in this life, troubles that cause suffering in our lives. This is the occasion when Jesus Christ came walking out on the water to the disciples and, and uh, that there was this storm and, and they thought they saw Jesus and they said, it's a ghost. But Jesus said, no, so it's me. Don't worry about that. 
And then there was the storm. And then you remember Peter said, Lord, if, let, let me walk on the water. And then for a time Peter walked on the water, but then he stopped looking at Jesus and he began to sink. Now there are three kinds of problems right there. Number one is imaginary. Some of the things that we consider to be a problem or sub, a, a source of difficulty or even suffering to us are, are imaginary. Maybe you're home alone one night and it's quiet outside and inside. And then you hear a noise coming from the attic and you wonder, well, what is that? Well, I'm told by those who build homes that houses have a tendency to make kind of noises sometimes. They, 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 the wood moves or it, it, it squeaks a little bit, tweaks. But you, you imagine there's somebody up there or you hear something outside. Maybe it's a, uh, the wind is blowing and, and it causes a bush to scrape up against the screen outside. But to you, it's not that. You imagine someone is out there. That's an imaginary problem. Or you see two people with their heads together and, and they're talking rather uh, low and you can't hear what they're saying and one of them glances your way for just momentarily and then turns back talking. And you begin to think, they're talking about me, aren't they? When in reality... They may be discussing something rather serious to one of them. Has nothing to do with you. That's imaginary. And then in this story, there, there are those that are real problems. The storm was not imaginary. There was absolutely nothing imaginary about the storm. It was very real. And some of the problems that we deal in life that cause us pain and suffering are very real. Your home burns during the night. You lose everything you own except the clothes that you have on. There's not anything imaginary about that. Or maybe you lose all of your life savings in a, in a bad business deal. And you wonder how you're going to make it in the future. Folks, there's not anything imaginary about that. Or you go to the doctor for, for an examination and and he detects something that's not quite like it's been in the past when you would have examinations, and he, he does some further testing, and as he does this further testing, he comes back and he tells you, I'm, I'm afraid that you might have cancer. There isn't anything imaginary about diagnosis like that. That's very real. So some of the problems we have in life are real problems. And then some of the problems we have are of our own doing. Now, think about Peter. Peter said, Lord, let me walk on the water. And, and he started walking on the water. And then what Peter did, he took his eyes off the Lord of the waves and he started looking at the waves. And when he did, he began to sink. Nobody made him take his eyes off of Jesus. That was of his own doing. And so many of the problems that we have in this life, sufferings even that we have are, are real. They're very real, but they're real and they're of our own doing because some decisions that we have made. You see, we have the power to make decisions. But I know sometimes when people are trying to explain suffering in our lives, they, they come up with some ideas that are not quite as, they, I call it inadequate explanations. But for some people just deny the reality of problems. They deny the reality of suffering. That's what Mary Baker Eddy and her followers did. They claimed that, that sickness is not real. You just think you're sick. That, that what you think is a sickness is just a result of improper uh, thought processes. Well, you, you tell a person's dying with cancer that. I went to see a gospel preacher just a few days ago, just a little over a week ago. He had stage four cancer. And I had prayer with him before I left. 
And there were tears in his eyes and tears in my eyes. We'd been friends for many, many years. And he died just two days ago. There wasn't anything imaginary about that illness. It's very, very real. And I think most of us would find it hard to, to accept the point of view that, that it's not real, that it's just imaginary. You hear a person, they've been healthy for years. Uh, they, for all the years that you've known this individual, they've been healthy and they, they look like the, the, the epitome of health. And then they, they get a terminal illness and then they begin to go down, physically go down and down and down until they die. A friend of mine who was also working with me and getting to know your Bible, Tom Neal. Why, Tom looked like the healthiest person I think I've ever seen in my life. He, he ran every day. He watched 28 but he went to the doctor, had five blockages, had surgery, and two weeks later, Tom Neal died. There's not anything imaginary about that. Now, some, some people try to explain suffering like this. Suffering is a result of sin in our life. You've done something wrong, or, or this wouldn't be happening to you. I've really had people tell me that. They, they, they thought because of what's happening to them that they must have done something terribly, terribly wrong. Well, that's what one of Job's friends tried to tell him. His, his friend's name was Eliphaz. And let me read to you what Eliphaz to, told Job in Job chapter 4. He said in verse 7 and verse 8, Remember, I pray thee, who, whoever perished being innocent. Now think about that. Whoever perished being innocent. Job, if you were innocent, this wouldn't be happening to you because whoever perished being innocent. Or when were the righteous cut off? Even as I have seen they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. Now, now in essence, what Eliphaz was telling Job, Job, the reason that you're suffering so it's because, Job, you must have done something terribly, terribly wrong for this to be happening. And they were wrong. They were wrong. You, you think about over in John, the ninth chapter, there, there was a man that was born blind. And, and the people were asking, now who sinned? Was it this man that sinned so that he's blind? Or did his parents sin so that he's blind? And, and Jesus said, neither. He's not blind because of his parents. He's not blind because of something that he did that is wrong. To suggest that we, that we suffer because of there's something in our life that is wrong is an inadequate explanation about suffering. And the blindness uh, in, in that case of the blind man uh, resulted in Jesus working a miracle to teach a great lesson. And so many of the things that happen in our lives help the Lord to teach us a great lesson. I think about a young man by the name of Joseph. Now he suffered. Think about this. Joseph's brothers tried to get rid of him. Actually, they wanted to kill him. But one of his brothers intervened and said, no, no, let's just, let's just sell him as a slave. And they did. They put, they put Joseph in a pit in the ground. Uh, and, and I call that the holding pit. Waiting for the slave traders to come by. And they wanted to sell Joseph. Can you imagine the pain in his heart? When Joseph knew that his own flesh and blood were doing this to him, his brothers... Of all people, his brothers were doing this to him. Do you think Joseph sat in that hole in the ground and, and reasoned like this? Well, this hurts me about as much as anything that has ever happened in my life. I, it, it, I'm just devastated over it. But I know that someday God's going to take this bad thing that's happened to me and work it out for good in my life. 
I don't believe Joseph thought that for a moment at that time. Jo jo Joseph was a young man, and in all probability, he thought that's the worst thing that ever happened to him in his life. But years later, his brothers had to come down to Egypt. And now Joseph, still alive, is second in command in Egypt. And Joseph is, has prepared the people in Egypt for a famine that was coming. And J Joseph's father sent his brothers to Egypt to get food for their families lest they die. And who do you suppose his brothers had to talk to about getting food, Joseph. They didn't recognize him seemingly. And when Joseph revealed himself to them, they probably thought Joseph was dead. So they were shocked when they found out Joseph was still alive. And no doubt they thought he's going to get even with us now. He's going to avenge himself. But this is what Joseph said to them. Going back to the time that, that he, he was in that pit in the ground, he probably thought about that day when his heart was breaking. And Joseph said to his brother, Now you meant that for evil, but God meant it for good. That's found in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 21. So, so God can take a tragedy, something in our lives and and turn that around for our good. Sometimes we'll say, people will say, well, it was just the will of God. Oh, I want us to look closely at this idea about the will of God and look at it from a, from a threefold point of view. First of all, there is the in, intentional will of God. Now that's when God in turns, intends that every person have peace and good things in his life. For example, in Matthew 5, 45, we learn that, that God causes the sun and the rain to, 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 to fall upon and to shine upon the evil and the good all alike. That's what God intends. That he doesn't want anybody to do without the rain, anybody to do without the sunshine, and He wants all people everywhere to repent. He doesn't want them to perish, according to 2 Peter 3 and 9. God does not plot evil and tragic events in the lives of people. He only wants what is best for us. But now there is the permissive will of God. When God created the universe and, and made man, He did two things. Number one, He created an orderly world that operates upon dependable rules that we call the laws of nature. Number two, He created man with freedom of will. We sometimes say that man is a free moral agent, and that is true. We have the ability to make decisions and to make choices. Now, God created a natural world that, that is regular and systematic. And I want you to think about how essential that is for the world that we live in to be regular and systematic. Just suppose that the sun rose one day, but not the next day. Then the next day it would rise, but not the next day. Or suppose gravity only worked three days a week. Now, what would happen to us the rest of the week? What would happen to those days that the sun did not rise? You see, there are laws that God has established in the natural world, and man has to live within the parameters of those laws. And as long as we abide by the laws of nature, everything runs smoothly. But what happens when we break those laws? Well, when we break those laws, we suffer certain consequences. For example, my grandfather thought that he could fly. And I don't ask me why, uh, he, when he was a young man, he got on the top of the barn with turkey feathers. He thought that he could take those turkey feathers and flop them, I suppose, and that he could fly from the top of the barn. But you know, the law of gravity was still in force back in my grandfather's day. And he hit the ground 
And we are told, the family has been told that he nearly bit his tongue off when he hit the ground. He couldn't fly, and he could not defy the law of gravity. There are consequences when you try to def defy the law of gravity. And so there is God's permissive will. He permits things to happen to us, not because it is His intentional will, but because we're living in a world where God has certain natural laws in existence. Now there is the ultimate will of God. The, the sinful will of man can temporarily delay the will of God, but never His ultimate will. It, 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 God, circumstances change and they vary in our lives, but they never can defeat the ultimate will of God. Everything that happens is not God's will, not in the sense that God intends it. God does not intend that a man get on the top of a, of a ten-story building and jump off of that building thinking that God is going to save him when he hits the ground. He is defying the natural law of God. It's not God's intention that that man die when he tries to defy the law of gravity, but he may die as a result of jumping off of that ten-story building because he violated the natural law of God. God intends that we abide by His natural laws, and so long as we abide by His natural laws, good will come in our lives, and that's God's will that we abide by His natural laws. God has His spiritual laws, and so long as we abide by the spiritual laws of God, good will come to us. And so I encourage all of us to think about what we're doing with the will of God. And in His providence, God wants to work things out in the lives of His children for good and not bad. Listen to Romans 8, 28. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible. It's probably yours as well. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them that are the called according to His purpose. That's God's providence. And the word provide is the root word of providence. You see, God in His love and kindness and grace provides for His children within the parameters of His natural and spiritual laws. Listen to that verse again. We know that the providence of God is assured. There isn't any doubt about this. No question. We know that all things, it's all inclusive. All things. Now Paul is not suggesting when he says all things that the bad things that happen in our lives, the, the sinful things that happen in our lives are, are included in those all things because they're not. All things work together. That's harmony. Everything is working together in harmony for, for good. All things work together for good. That's the beneficent part of the providence of God. They're working together for our benefit, for our good. We may not see that good, but good can come from the things that are working in our lives according to the providence of God. All things work together for good to them that love the Lord. There's the limitation. It's to the, those that love the Lord. Paul is not suggesting that all things work together for good. It's the person that flaunts the will of God, that turns his nose up at the will of God, that rejects the will of God. He's talking about that individual who submits to the will of God. And that when suffering comes in our lives, God's going to work those things out in our lives for some good, some benefit. I had a grandson die a few years back. Matter of fact, it's nine years. He would be 20 years old today, uh, this, this year. 
And I thought that was the most tragic thing that has ever happened in our family, other than the fact that his mother died just a few years before him. But we've seen so much good come out of that. I continually hear people who say by, by, by thinking about his life and things that he did as a young child, it turned their heart toward God. So good's still happening. It happens in your life. It can happen in mine. But we have to look for the good. And it's God's will, God's purpose, that we serve Him within the parameters of His will and law. And to do that, we got to obey His will to be saved, haven't we? And His will is that we believe in His Son. His will is that we be willing to repent of our sins. It is His will that we're willing to confess that we believe in His Son and that we are immersed in His Son but for, the, for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. Would you do that today? In the closing seconds, let me mention the fact that we want you to visit the Church of Christ in your community and right now pick up the telephone and call for the free Bible correspondence course. Don't, don't hesitate. Don't delay. Call right now and we'll send it to you free of charge. I want you to know how much I appreciate your watching the day. May God bless you and may, may the Lord be with you and bless you until we meet again. This is my prayer. We want to help you as much as possible in your search for a personal relationship with God. You can now easily access our free Bible correspondence course online at gettingtoknowyourbible.com. If there's any way we can help you grow closer to God, please email us at gettingtoknowyourbible at yahoo.com or call us anytime at 1-877-711-5214. Getting to Know Your Bible has been presented by Churches of Christ. If you have a question about the church, or if you would like the location of a Church of Christ near you, or to receive the free Bible course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible, P.O. Box 314, Summerdale, Alabama 36580, or call 1-877-711-5214. Join us next time for Getting to Know Your Bible.